Hi guys, and welcome once again to Curated Logic, where we try and up your brain game. Today, I'm going to be doing a follow-up video to a video I did a few weeks ago on how to beat an escape room. This is going to be the first of three videos, and we'll focus today on puzzles that have number solutions. In a couple of weeks, I'll do the second video, which will focus on puzzles that have letter solutions. And then a couple of weeks after that, I will focus on puzzles that are more physical and anything else miscellaneous that I think you need to know. Of course, so many puzzles incorporate all three of these elements, numbers, letters, and the physical side of things. So what I really wanted to focus on in each video is the end result. So for instance, if you are looking at a lock that has numbers on it, that will fall into the number puzzle video. So any puzzles that end up having the solution as numbers will be focused on today. With that in mind, let's get going, put your maths hat on and have some fun. So the first puzzle is probably the easiest and one that you will come across a number of times in an escape room. And all you need to be able to do is count. So you may come across in an escape room objects that are similar, but within the one similar group, there will be smaller groups that have differentiating features that separate them from the other groups. So for instance, let's say you are in a room and there are a whole bunch of masks on a wall. They are similar because they are masks and maybe even the same type of mask, but they are different because maybe there's four blue ones and three red ones and a couple of yellow ones. And what all you have to do in this case, generally speaking, is count the number of each different color in this instance in order to get a combination. So of course, you're not gonna know which order to put the numbers in straight away. You will have to find generally some sort of hint or maybe a legend that gives you colors in a certain order, but that's really all there is to it. So if you know how to count and you can see pretty well, then you should be good to go. Okay, so another type of puzzle that involves counting is a sequence. A sequence puzzle is typically a series of numbers that has a few missing, and those missing numbers when put together form a combination for a lock or a safe or whatever. You may think that the hardest bit of a sequence is the maths behind it, trying to figure out how the sequence progress progresses in order to get those numbers. And in many cases, you're right. A lot of people don't find maths that easy, but, do not underestimate how difficult it can be sometimes in figuring out that what you're actually looking at is a sequence. This is because although you may find an escape room every now and then that literally just gives you numbers and a couple of question marks and points it out really obviously that you're looking at a sequence, for the most part, you're not going to get that. You're going to get more obscure references to a sequence. So for instance, say if you are given a booklet and the booklet has images on each page and each page has a certain number of moons. But then in the middle of the booklet, there's a couple of pages missing or a couple of pages that are just blank. The hint is those blank pages or those missing pages because they are meant to tell you that you need to know and figure out what is on those pages. And from that, you should be able to see that, oh, there's, I should be counting these moons and figuring out how to get how many moons are on each of those pages. And it has to then be pretty much a sequence. But so many people don't understand that part. And so many people miss any hints or tips that are within the room telling you that what you are meant to do is a sequence. So if you end up missing those hints, at least knowing that that is what this type of puzzle looks like will help you a lot.
Okay, so when you hear sound in an escape room, it's really important to listen to it. That goes without saying, and it's kind of obvious, but it's also really important not to interrupt it, even if the sound is a mundane, normal sound. So, for instance, I worked in an escape room that had sound as part of a puzzle, and it was a major, it was, in fact, sound was basically the entire puzzle, but there was an ability to stop the sound if it was annoying or if you thought it was unnecessary. And people did this half the time. So I'll give you an example. This isn't the example from the, my escape room, but it's a different example. Um, let's say you close a door in the escape room. And when you close that door, a doorbell rings. Your first instinct would be to then open the door to see who is there, why it rang. Right? If you then find nothing behind that door and it didn't do anything obvious, close the door again. Because if you close the door again and hear that doorbell, you should be listening to the sound in its entirety. Because so often what will happen is that the sound will just be a code. It will be two doorbell rings, then a break before three doorbell rings, then a break before two more doorbell rings. And eventually you will know that you have a sequence, a code that you are meant to put into, again, a lock or a safe or whatever. The way really to figure this out the easiest is through repetition. So if you close that door and the doorbell rings and it does its little thing with breaks in between each number and then stops, wait a little bit longer because likely it will start again. And then you will just repeat the same combination. And that shows you that what you were looking for is just that combination. It's not, uh, you don't have to listen to it for longer. You don't have to keep on going until it reveals something magical or secret or much more difficult than just counting. So if you hear a sound, investigate it, yes. But if nothing comes of it, and you've stopped it somehow by opening or closing a door, do whatever you did to make the sound start and really listen to it until you feel like there's nothing else you can get out of it. Because a lot of the time, it is just a matter of counting and getting a combination from that. Outside of counting, another way that escape rooms will present numbers is, obviously, through writing them. And whilst you may think it's really obvious to recognize a number off the bat, escape rooms will hide them. They will make it as hard as possible to recognize that what you were looking at is actually a number. One way they do that is by reverse imaging. Now, you might think that I'm just talking about flipping a number back to front. And yes, escape rooms do that, but they are kind of easy to see and easy to recognize what they are. But other escape rooms will do, quite commonly, do a reverse image bumped up against the normal image. Usually the reverse image is on the left if you're looking at it and your right is the normal image, if that makes any sense. It kind of looks like this. And so what you end up getting is something that looks like abstract art, something that could easily be mistaken for decoration. And escape rooms will play on this. A lot of the time you'll find escape rooms will put them in fancy mirrors and make them look pretty. And people will think, oh, maybe it's just some sort of symbol that will come up later, like some interesting thing where I'll get a, I'll get a legend and it will tell me what the symbols represent, or maybe it is just art or whatever. But if you look at it direct on, you can see it's just a number. So my hint with this is, if you come across any sort of imagery that is symmetrical, so whether it's symmetrical um, vertically or horizontally, they do it both ways, have a look at both halves individually. So even maybe cover one half to have a look at the other and see if you recognize something that together you wouldn't have recognized. Another way that escape rooms will hide numbers in imagery is hiding them in letters. 
So I'm not talking about like a group of text and there's just some random numbers peppered throughout the text. That's not what I'm talking about. Although something like that I discuss later. What I'm talking about is actually using letters to represent numbers. So I am sure that the majority of people watching this got a little kick when they were younger out of typing a certain number into your calculator, flipping it upside down and revealing the word boobies. Something that we all did. Well, at least everyone I know did. And there are a number of letters that if you look at them a certain way, they look like numbers. So obviously in this instance, you're trying to, in the calculator instance, you're trying to get numbers to look like letters, but it just obviously works the other way around as well. So for instance, let's say you do a puzzle and the result you get is this. You may look at that and think, okay, well, I'll just put that into a letter lock. Or if that doesn't work, I will just see if there's an anagram of these letters in order to put in that letter lock. But if that doesn't work or all you have is a number lock, don't just ignore these letters. Because if we just flip them like so, you can see that they form a four digit combination. So my advice to you with this is just have a look at the alphabet, get used to letters that can represent numbers and numbers that can represent letters. And then if you come across any that are grouped together without, let's say a J in there, which cannot really represent a number, then have a go and see if you can get a number out of it. If of course the letters don't work. A lot of the time though, if you're getting numbers to look like letters or letters to look like numbers, you will be prodded in that direction. You'll get some sort of hint that you're looking for numbers rather than letters. So always take that into consideration. But again, if you miss that hint or that hint's gonna come later, you may be able to solve something quicker than you should be able to. One puzzle that seems like it would be easy, but is not always that easy, is having numbers written out. There are a number of ways of doing this, but one of the most typical ways is to write them in a story. Now, if they were individually written, just as the number here and there, which does happen, um, it's not difficult. You can just pick those numbers out and you're done. But a lot of the time, an escape room wrote won't write the word as one word, but will write it across two words. So for instance, if you get a story and one of the phrases in the story is half our water, there is a number in there. The number is four, because if you take the end of half, the F, and the whole word our, it takes, it says, when you run it together, four. And this is how they will do it. They will take the end of one word and take the beginning of the next word and expect you to be able to join the dots to see where those numbers are. And once you take all of those out of it, you will have a combination you need. Like I say, the easier way of this happening is through actual numbers in a story. These don't have to be written out in letter form. They can just be numbers. But if you're reading a story and you're going through it and there's a list or there's numbers peppered throughout it, for instance, it's a story about four dogs that meet one woman who lives in two houses or something like that, take those numbers out. That should be your first port of call. That should be the hint that you probably need those numbers for something. They might form a sequence or they might just be a combination to a lock. But if numbers appear in a story, take those numbers out. Even if you don't need them, it's much better that you try that than not. Typically the next puzzle is used in combination with maps. Not because it has to be, but because maps are the easiest way to do this. And that is drawing numbers. 
Escape rooms will try and get you to draw the numbers without you recognizing that you are in fact drawing numbers. So one way they will do this is send you maybe on a little trip. You might have a diary saying, this person went here, to here, to here, to here. And if you join those dots together on a map, it will form a number. Of course, this sometimes happens with letters as well, um, but I put it in the number one because I've seen it. I've actually probably seen it more with numbers than I have with letters. So if you get a map or you get some directions or you get something that's not a map but has you pinpoint certain parts of it, join them together. Use a pen or a piece of string or whatever you have to join them together and see if it makes anything legible. The final three tips to explore are really easy. The first is dates. There are two ways, generally speaking, dates are used. You will either have a series of information, each on different pages or something like that, that you have to put into chronological order. Then once you do, it will somehow reveal something to you that will help you solve another puzzle or give you a combination. The other way is that you have to actually solve a date. There might be a date missing on a piece of paper and you have to figure out what date that is. And you should usually have enough information in what you have to figure out what date that piece of paper belongs to. Sometimes it will combine both those two methods and you will have to put them in chronological order. And because you've put them in chronological order, that will help you figure out what date is missing. So if you come across any dates anywhere or a number of different dates, put them in chronological order, see if any are missing, and if they are, hone in on that one. You may also find, much to people's chagrin, that you come across actual maths, like real maths in an escape room. And this usually takes the form of equations. There are two ways equations come into play. The first is obvious. The first is right in front of you. So you'll have, for instance, an equation on a blackboard or something, and it will have some missing components that you need to figure out in order to move forward. Easy. The other way is a little more difficult. The other way is an equation that you don't actually know what the equation is necessarily. So you might be given a puzzle and given all the components of a puzzle, but you have to figure out how mathematically to work out the answer. You aren't given what you need to do, you have to figure that out yourself. These are typically harder, like I say, and in fact, the escape room I worked at had one that would so often stump people for a good portion of the 60 minute game. So what I suggest is if you're not good at maths or you don't really enjoy maths puzzles too much, just practice them. Have a good go at a few online. There are some really good resources online. Have a go at a few of them and become better because there's not really that much else you can do in order to be able to be better at solving that type of puzzle. And finally, on things that need to be practiced in order to be better at them, there is always the possibility that you're gonna come across some pretty famous maths puzzles in an escape room. I have done a number of escape rooms where uh, I've had to do a Sudoku or a magic square or something that I have previously come across when I did maths in high school or I've done maths online. And so these are puzzles that if you don't, if you haven't tried them before, if you don't know what you're doing, they will take you a bit of time to get through. But if you practice them, and there's so many places you can find these online, then you will breeze through them. You won't get them in every escape room, but if you just become a little better at them, trust me, when you do come across them, you'll thank yourself for that. And also, they develop certain skills that will help you in solving the equations that you don't know from the last hint I gave. So I definitely suggest getting online and giving some famous maths puzzles a go. Can only help. So that's it for numbers. Of course, I haven't covered every single number puzzle that can come up in an escape room, but I feel like I've touched on enough 
that you should now have the logic, if you didn't have it before, to be able to tackle any curveball you're throwing that deals with numbers in an escape room. I'll be back to do the same thing, but this time about letters in a couple of weeks. If you haven't followed me, please do on my socials, which are listed below, especially Instagram, because I put three new riddles up each week that are really often number-based and often letter-based. And some of them will appear, similar things will appear in escape rooms. So they will help you, if you can solve them, help you practice your escape room game. You can also support me on Patreon, which is also listed below. Okay, wherever you are in the world, I hope you are well and you are safe. Until next time, keep on upping your brain game and have fun. See ya.